Okay, well, welcome to this discussion of uh, fiduciary duties and particularly conflicts of interest. And we're lucky to be joined today by Vice Chancellor Travis Laster of the Delaware Chancery Court. And um, by way of introduction, I'll just say that I don't know that we could have uh, found a better authority to, uh, to confer with on this topic. Vice Chancellor Laster has uh, written uh, a number of opinions that uh, delve into the fiduciary duties of board uh, members in companies that have been backed by venture capital or uh, or private equity. And I would say most famously, uh, the Trados decision, which uh, recently enjoyed its 10th anniversary. And so um, uh, probably the most notable uh, venture-backed fiduciary duty case uh, around. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, I think a natural starting point would be to talk about the Trados decision. So I wonder if you might be able to give us an overview of what you see as the uh, essential facts of that case and its key holdings. Uh, so sure. Um, it it came to me midstream uh, and I had it for the, the trial and the, the post-trial decision. Um, what people mostly focus on is that it was a case that was a washout for the common. Uh, so it was a VC-backed company uh, that ended up getting sold uh, for an amount that wasn't sufficient to uh, clear the preferred stockholders liquidation preference. Um, it might have had some value uh, for the common there, but there was also a, a management incentive plan uh, that ensured that uh, the money got swept uh, either to the management team uh, or to the common. Um, so that got uh, challenged by a 5% stockholder. And so the, the first notable fact about the case is just that there was a challenge. Uh, at least at that point, there was very little litigation involving startups uh, for you know, various uh, really uh, social uh, reasons as opposed to anything about the dynamics of the, of the situation. Uh, so the fact that there was this, this lawsuit was the first significant fact. Um, the second significant fact was that it was a common washout, which really put the the uh, uh, magnifying glass on the conflict that exists between um, the preferred to the extent it has a fixed claim via its liquidation preference and the common uh, with a, a dollop of the of the management conflict uh, thrown in there as well. Um, and then in terms of the 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 key facts and the way the case unfolded, um, what was, I think, significant is that the, the preferred uh, were fairly clear in terms of the testimony of their directors about what they thought about and what they didn't think about. And they, they didn't think about residual claim maximization. Um, they tried at trial through uh, what I found to be very coordinated testimony uh, to get that in the back door. Um, but at the time, uh, in real time, it was fairly clear that they didn't give any uh, uh, consideration of the common stockholders. So that's that's how the case sets up. It sets up as a as a question of um, uh, you know, what duties, if any, exist in this uh, setting, and then uh, how do you apply those duties? And so the the, the key holdings were um, first of all that this ends up being a conflict transaction uh, because of a, a conflict that the preferred directors have and those who are not disinterested from them have uh, because they are, are dual fiduciaries and therefore caught between a, an obligation to maximize the value of the corporation and an obligation to maximize their own claims for their funds. Um, then that leads to the application of the entire fairness test. Uh, and then uh, the ultimate holding was that uh, the case, that the transaction was fair uh, the two dimensions of entire fairness on fair process, the holding was that really the process wasn't fair. Um, they didn't do anything to try to look after the, the common. Uh, they basically made some decisions along the way, particularly the MIP, the management incentive plan uh, that were uh, clearly designed to drive their own interests. Um, but that notwithstanding all that on fair price, uh, the amount of consideration that they obtained uh, was fair. And even though the common didn't have, didn't receive anything in the merger, it didn't have any value in standalone either. 
Um, and that was a function of two things. First, the amount of the preferred liquidation preference, but also this 8% cumulative dividend that the preferred was going to have. And my assessment was that this company, it could continue in steady state. It might have generated some potential return, but it was never going to generate enough to create uh, any type of, of value for the common north of that 8% cumulative dividend. So ultimately, the, the defendants won, uh, but they won in a case that um, wasn't very complimentary of what they had done. So I, I'm i sure that, uh, or I suspect that uh, for some of them, it didn't feel like they won because, uh, you know, again, I didn't say nice things about how they proceeded. Um, but in terms of actually having to come out of pocket for money, uh, they were not held liable. Uh, and uh, I held that they had not breached their dues. Uh, excellent overview. I, I want to I want to dig in on one um, uh, aspect of what you said, which is that um, sort of a, a key holding is uh, that, that there is a conflict of interest in that situation where the preferred uh, board decides to sell the company in a situation where the common might prefer to continue on. And um, I, I do think it 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 uh, uh, bears a little emphasis that. Um, that wasn't necessarily obvious under some theories of corporate law fiduciary duties. In other words, it uh, somewhat flows from a premise that the board's primary responsibility is to the common, as you said, a sort of uh, mindset of residual value maximization. Um, uh, that, I think, is the part of the case that maybe got the law professors most excited. Um, and so I, I wonder if you might just reflect a little bit on whether as you were writing this opinion, you thought that you were writing on an unsettled point of law or uh, saying something new or innovative or whether this was uh, more or less just a straightforward application of existing principles. Uh, the, the reality is I, I, I rarely think I'm doing anything new or innovative. Um, I <laughs> Much, uh, almost invariably think that uh, what I'm doing uh, has support in uh, in existing uh, law. Um, what I do, what I do find is that um, you know I, I, for better or for worse, I tend to say things more directly than uh, you know other judges are much more skillful in in fuzzing things up a little bit so that uh, people don't get uh, get angry about them. Uh, get angry at them, uh, and I I don't have uh, that 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 skill. So um, in terms of this this conflict between preferred and and common and where that uh, shakes out, um, I I do think that perhaps there there were a couple things going on there. Um, there there are different philosophical underpinnings of the corporation, which of course drive different outcomes. Um, even within the Delaware framework where we historically have said that uh, directors owe fiduciary duties to the corporation for the ultimate benefit of the stockholders. You have this, this question of, well, what do you mean by stockholders? Um, and so one of the things that preferred stockholders in particular were fond of saying is, well, we are also stockholders. You can't claim we're not stockholders, we're stockholders. Uh, so you should have to maximize uh, the value of our rights as well. Um, so what, what the way I think of this is, again, there's, there's two steps in an analysis as I approach it. There's the standard of conduct and there's the standard of review. And this is really a standard of conduct question. It's to whom do your duties run? What is the, what is the direction that you have to think about? And then in terms of the standard of review, we're going to we're going to evaluate how you fulfilled that charge. But the first question is, is what is your, what is your charge? And so the, the way I think about this and the way I think um, historically Delaware has thought about this is you are supposed to maximize the value of the corporation, which means that you're, you're supposed to maximize the residual, which in my world means what's left after you've paid off all of the other obligations. So if you think about things like, you know, the most obvious one is a secured claim. Uh, so your, your secured debt, then you might have mezzanine debt, then you might have some uh, general creditors. Um, and in the stack of general creditors, you're going to have, you know, any claims of your employees, et cetera. Um, and then these preferred stockholders are going to have some type of liquidation preference. 
And so the, the, the initial question is, how do you think of that liquidation preference? Is it something that is residual, i.e. something that is left over after you've paid everything else off? Or is it in the nature of a, of a contractual claim um, that has priority over the, the residual uh, and therefore should be treated that way? And it, it seemed to me, based uh, on a, a number of our decisions, uh, often those from Chancellor Allen, that the preferred claim, as long as it was asserting a liquidation preference, really was contractual. I mean, this was not a claim for you know what's left. Um, so when I think about the idea that the that the board has to maximize what's left, that functionally is synonymous with maximizing value for the common. And that's how Chancellor Allen had said it in Equity Link. I think technically that's not precisely true because you can have more people in the residual than just the common. So if you think about a, a participating preferred that's going to get its liquidation preference and then, for example, have the right to participate pro rata or on an as converted basis with the common, in that sense, the preferred is part of the residual. But what they're not part of the residual for is their liquidation preference. That's a that's a contract claim. Um, and so uh, from my standpoint, I thought this idea of common value maximization or residual value maximization, I thought it really permeated Delaware law. Um, I think the, the place where most law professors think of it is, is Revlon. Um, and I have never and thought of Revlon as a unique setting, something that is you know, only defined by the, the, um, the sale context. I think it's unique in the sense of the standard of review but I don't think it's unique in the sense of the standard of conduct. So I think that sort of common value maximand, which is the, the short form for it, comes out of these other cases. But where I think, what I think Tra Trados did, for better or for worse, was put the question cleanly and, and say, in this setting where you have a stack of contractual claims, even contractual claims that are tied to something that is a preferred share, you're participating as a contractual claimant. And so fiduciary duties don't run to you. Uh, fiduciary duties run to the people that are actually part of the residual. Um, and so I, I think you're right that particularly for the law professors, uh, you know, particularly those who didn't believe that, uh, that was a, you know, a, something to, to push back on. Uh, and you know, that, that, that probably is, is you're right, what uh, what got a good bit of, of attention. But I, I didn't think I was saying something new as much as, uh, you know, for better or for worse, uh, I, I think, you know, hopefully for better, uh, perhaps saying it more more clearly. Great. So so uh, uh, let's kind of pick up on uh, the standard of review question. In other words, uh, one way of saying that from our audience's standpoint is um, having told the board what they're supposed to do, uh, you'll then consider uh, either uh, with a lot of detail or a lighter touch whether they did that <laughs> or not. Um, and so in this situation where a preferred controlled board is authorizing a sale of the company that has this type of effect on the common holders, you're going to be looking for certain types of um, actions, concrete actions by a board that um, that 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 show and demonstrate that they were properly trained on this objective of maximizing the the value for common holders. So, um, what is it that would uh, that would convince you that a board in the trade off situation? understood their fiduciary duties and was taking them seriously. Yeah. So uh, let's, I'll, I'll step back because you, you talked about, you know, light touch versus heavier touch. So um, Delaware functionally has three tiers of standard review. Um, our very light touch standard is the one that everyone knows about. That's the business judgment rule. Um, that's where we presume that you're doing everything right. Uh, the plaintiff has to come in and, and, first plead and later prove that you're doing something wrong. Uh, and as long as you have some rational basis for whatever you're doing, that's perfectly fine. Um, the other end of the spectrum is entire fairness. Uh, that's when uh, one of the prongs of the business judgment rule has been rebutted, usually loyalty. 
And so you're in a conflicted situation. And there, for better or for worse, your judgment is compromised. Um, so it, it's not a situation where your business judgment can be deferred to uh, because of this this interest that you know would cause your your uh, your thinking to to skew in some way, likely uh, to your own benefit. In between, we have this standard of reasonableness that applies in specific settings. It's called enhanced scrutiny, and it applies in specific settings where they're just it's tough decisions. It's decisions where um, uh, we there's reason to think that your interests as a director may diverge. But it's not so clear as a as a direct conflict situation. So so Trados, um, it it started out. We always start out with the business judgment rule, and we're looking in the first instance for conflicts. And so in in Trados, as I already talked about, there was this conflict because if nothing else, a majority of the board had this dual fiduciary problem where they were also uh, representing uh, preferred stock. And then um, at least one of the other directors had uh, um, you know, was not independent of the preferred stockholders. So that kicks you up into entire fairness. Um, you know, if there hadn't been that, there would have been a decent argument that because they were going through the, the sale process of selling the company, you would have had to act reasonably as opposed to just getting business judgment review. But I didn't have to think about that. I didn't have to worry about that because we elevated straight to entire fairness. So once you're in entire fairness, it's your burden as the conflicted person to prove that you have uh, acted in a manner that is just that, entirely fair. Um, and so our, our standard has two dimensions. It's a unitary standard. The idea is you look at the whole ball of wax and is the whole ball of wax fair? But for conceptual purposes, we think in two dimensions. We think in a procedural dimension, fair process, and we think in a substantive dimension, fair price. Um, fair process, what you actually did to get to the result is the one that is sort of the easiest for a judge to get his, his head around because it's, you know, how many meetings did you have? Um, did you hire good advisors? Uh, what do the minutes say that you thought about? What do the presentation materials that you have uh, indicate that you were thinking about? Um, what do... Uh, what is the the informational base you had in terms of knowing what the company was worth, knowing what other people would pay, uh, things of of that sort. Um, so there, this is where lawyers really uh, uh, your your outside counsel really uh, is put to the task. Um, they should be helping you create the type of process that will lead to a good decision, and which ultimately therefore will support the fact that you made a good decision. There's People will tell you, oh, we just have to have process. We want to have process because process, we think, leads to better decisions. So that means multiple meetings. It means getting materials before meetings with enough time to look at them and think about them. It means having advisors who are independent of management, uh, all these uh, things of, of that, that sort. Um, in, a, in, a con in a conflict transaction, it also means doing what you can to replicate some type of arm's length bargaining. Um, what we like, what we think of as the as the standard for a fair process is what happens when somebody negotiates with someone else. If you're an interested person, well, you can't do that. So what we like to see is people trying to replicate that uh, to the extent they can, which often means forming some type of, of special committee or, or of that sort. On the price dimension, um, that that's a contestable dimension because uh, value is is debatable. Um, in in Trados, for example, uh, we knew what they got from the third party. We knew what what the acquirer was willing to pay, sixty million. But what we didn't know and couldn't know was how much value Trados had on its own, had it continue to operate independently into the future. Um, and because value is is more difficult to establish or prove. Um, Process plays a uh, often plays a heavy heavy role in the analysis. On on value, that's where your substantive business decision comes into play. And what you need to be able to come in and say is, uh, here's what we thought about. Uh, here's what we believed. Here's why we took the deal we did. Um, 
part of what was disquieting and credibility impairing in Trados was the director's testimony. Um, there, when they had been deposed, they mostly said one thing. And then when they came in for trial, they all said something else. And what they all said was you know, very closely coordinated as if they'd all been rehearsed on what to say. Uh, and so the director's testimony was at some, a hurdle that they, they really had to overcome. Uh, what I like is when people come in and you know, say in their own words what they did, explain to me in their own words why they, they made a decision. Uh, and that's probably the most uh, uh, critical thing you can do is be thinking about the right objective and then be able to explain why what you did serves that objective. Excellent. Well, let me let me let me ask a question following up on uh, your point about um, about process. And so, I think uh, there is uh, a tendency there to think about the gold standard for process being a well resourced public company, where there are pretty well recognized mechanisms for uh, somewhat fixing or mitigating the conflicts of interest, namely having well-funded, independently operated, independent committees of boards, having meaningful shareholder votes with considerable numbers of disinterested shareholders, um, and uh, and high-priced uh, fairness opinions from advisors to sort of back all that up. Um, when I go talk to people who are uh, working regularly with startups, a point that they make uh, fairly frequently is that that's just not the environment that they operate in, um, and that they don't they don't have a ton of independent directors because the board is being used um, uh, as a kind of monitoring device for investors. Um, so it's 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 actually in conception, kind of uh, serving a different point. The shareholder base is overwhelmingly just people who are kind of in on the deal, and um, and so it's different. And so um, I guess my question is. Um, to what extent can you calibrate or adjust for this different environment when you consider what a what a fair process would be? Yeah, look, startup startup governance is hard. There's no question, and I and I completely agree with you that um, you know it's it, it's often the case that uh, uh, there aren't clearly independent directors on the board. Often, even the independents have uh, you know, relationships um, that you know, could create issues. Uh, and that quite often the resources aren't there. A lot of times, uh, you know, VCs have been using stage financing all the way. And so a lot of times these uh, transactions are happening against a backdrop of a setting where the company needs money. And so it doesn't have some massive uh, runway. That was actually one of the interesting things about, about Trados is that it wasn't in that setting. Trados was actually uh, mature, steady state, it wasn't going to, you know, hit a hit a home run uh, or even a double or a triple for uh, these uh, VC firms, but it didn't need money, so they weren't on this this uh, this time frame that a lot of a lot of VC companies often are. Look, I'm I'm sympathetic to all of that. I understand all of that, um, but you know, you still have to you still get judged by the same standards that we use because these standards are standards that apply to fiduciaries. And just like the trustee of a you know, relatively small trust has to follow the same rules against self-dealing that a trustee of you know some uh, massive uh, uh, multi-billion dollar trust does, just like the executor of a small estate has to do the same types of accountings and you know, abjure self-dealing to the same extent as you know, someone who uh, is uh, passing on uh, or overseeing a, an estate that passes on dynastic wealth. Um, so too, in these settings, these standards are going to apply. So I think a lot of times um, what may be best <laughs> is, to, is to bite the bullet on the idea that you're going to have to prove entire fairness and make sure that what you have done is thought hard about why what you are doing is fair so that you can explain well uh, and credibly that what you did was fair. So in lieu of you know, building in um, 
you know, uh, sort of public company style protective steps. Um, you know, make sure that you're actually thinking about the right things and, and documenting them uh, so that there's a, a record of that. What part of what you know made made Trados problematic is that there there wasn't that record. And to the contrary, the contemporaneous record indicated that there wasn't any effort to think about the comments. So what you had was you had very clear contemporaneous communications from the VC representatives back to their uh, their funds and their their partners on their funds saying things like, you know, this thing really isn't worth my time anymore. Um, uh, you know, I, it's time to get this thing sold. Uh, we'll get out, but you know, we're not going to make a lot of money on this. Um, and then a, a, a key factor for me was the the management incentive plan. Um, because even though you know everybody has uh, multiple uh, uh, incentives in this structure, the management in the Trados situation, management was aligned with the comments. And so they were in a position to you know essentially push for a deal that would have been common value maximizing and for all intents and purposes could have provided some counterbalancing force uh, to the preferred. Once this management incentive plan got put in place, um, the common, I mean, sorry, the, the management team's incentives shifted over and were aligned with the preferred. Now, look, that's why the preferred put it in, right? That's exactly why they established it. But what that did from, from my standpoint is it, is it took maybe the one player that could have been an advocate for the common uh, off that team and shifted them over to the preferred team. Um, so it's it's as much what you don't do as what you do. Uh, but I I agree with you. It's a problem. And the one the one um, comfort I guess I would say is that there are these these social factors, these dynamics that make Silicon Valley and venture capital startups a relatively lower risk environment for litigation. Um, a lot of times there just there just isn't that type of, of money there uh, in terms of, you know, it's not a it's not a large cap stock where where lawyers can hope to plaintiffs lawyers can hope to extract a, a, a large recovery. And as I say, there are these there are these relationship patterns where where people are more hesitant to sue. So on the one hand, like I don't think you ought to people ought to disregard that and say, oh well, you know, who cares? We'll just do whatever we want, and then uh, then uh, we'll settle. But I do think what it means is that if you um, you know are, are wondering where to spend your money, I'd I'd spend it on on real substance rather than on you know public company process, and count on the idea that if you do get to court and you're in front of somebody like me and you candidly explain what you did, not give rehearsed testimony that your lawyers told you might be a good idea to say, but actually candidly explain what you did, um, I think you're going to come out all right. Excellent. Um, uh, excellent. So let, let me let me ask a question that is um, uh, moving, again, out to a little bit more theoretical lens, but um, but I think is is interesting and important for board members, which is, uh, there is, I think, looming a little bit over this Trados question, uh, uh, some uncertainty about what the what the boundaries of the doctrine or case are. In other words, like at, at what at what point ought a director be concerned about Trados and about these kind of common and preferred conflicts? I think there's a stylized version or shorthand version of the case where in law firm memos and the like, um, Trados is relevant whenever a liquidation preference is triggered, um, you know, so, sort of a, a, a more rough cut at what it means. Um, but surely there's some category of cases where a company is just somewhat hopeless and, uh, and, and failure is kind of the norm in Silicon Valley and liquidation preferences are a ubiquitous financing arrangement. And so there are lots of companies where the assets are just sort of being shipped down to some liquidator and the comp or the company is being sold in a fire sale. And um, is there some point where the board can um, take some comfort in realizing that um, 
that even a fully committed common holder wouldn't want to keep going with this particular company? Like when, when, when can uh, the board sort of exhale and say, this doesn't even seem like I should be ready for fairness review, or is that the wrong way to look at it? I mean, it's people, people get emotionally involved in things. And, you know, one could, one could have said uh, that the, the plaintiff in the Trados case uh, it shouldn't have even pushed this. He had like, you know, five percent of the of the company. Um, you know, imagine a world where um, where Trados was worth uh, you know double what the deal price was. You know, so another another sixty sixty million. Um, I think I think he had five percent of the common. So even there, um, you know, it's it's not another another sixty million. He's going to get three of that. Like there's um, there's just, it's it's hard to see economic value in terms of litigation in these settings. And so what is usually driving it is somebody who feels aggrieved. So the the folks who usually sue are, for example, the original founder team who had a bunch of common um, were replaced as the as the company grew. Uh, and then um, have been you know, slowly washed out over the years with dilution, uh, but in any event, get nothing or get very little in the deal. And they are the ones who are usually emotionally involved. And, and so to the extent you see, see lawsuits, uh, there's often some type of dynamic. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because you know, if, if someone is, is emotionally committed and emotionally engaged, um, they may not look at things as as rationally as uh, as someone who's purely a, a dollar and cents person. So, um, and because value is contestable, they may have you know caviar dreams about what this company could have been worth. Um, so I'm I'm not sure there is ever a time when people should be thinking, oh well, I don't ever have to worry about this. And I would also say that in terms of the standard of conduct. The standard of conduct doesn't change. So um, you're always trying to maximize the value of the corporation for the residual. So you always ought to be ought to be thinking about this issue because that's the that's the standard of conduct that you're going to follow. Now let's get to you know sort of more brass tax issue, uh, more brass brass tax sense. Um, you know part of the, what what made Trados a, a, a difficult case. Um, and a litigable case was that this really was a sideways situation where the value uh, plus or minus was in the vicinity of an area where the common could take. And if you are you know, dealing with a company that isn't in that setting, so let's say you know uh, down into the preferred liquidation preference, um, I mean everybody's going to have a, a a different sense of value. And as I as I say, particularly for the pre-revenue companies. You know, the, the range can be can be uh, wide, um, but if you are are down in the the preferred liquidation preference you know, by some significant amount, and particularly if you're a, a pre-revenue company that is dependent upon another round of staged financing, and if on top of that your existing investors don't want to put in anymore, um, that's going to be a a signal to the rest of the market that. You know, there's a lemon problem here, um, and so there, in that sort of setting, there really isn't a path to value for the mm -hmm. common. Um, and so, on those, you know, what I would still like to see in that setting is I would still like to see a, a director who, you know, if the case gets to trial, and who knows if it would, but I would still like to be able to hear from a director. Yes, I knew my job was to maximize the value of the corporation. Yes, I knew I had to think about ultimately that meant the holders of the residual, which is the common. I thought hard about that. And when we thought about what this company, where it was, it just wasn't panning out in terms of what expectations right. had been. Um, our lead investor had made clear to us and we had asked them three times that they weren't going to put in whether they were going to put in any more money. And they consistently said no. Um, we thought about whether we would we could go out and try to raise more money, but with that person saying that they weren't going to put in, we didn't think we'd get you know any any bites. 
ideally maybe they could say and we actually did go out and talk to you know five or six firms and they all said no um and so based on that i had to make a hard choice i didn't want to do this but uh, you know in my ideally this company would have been great i understand that uh, people cared about it a lot the employees had a lot invested in it but the reality was that it just wasn't financeable and it didn't have the ability to operate on its own and it was beneath the it was underwater in terms of liquidation preference so shutting it down was the best uh option uh uh including for uh, uh the common i mean there isn't what you don't have to do in that setting is you know destroy value to hopefully you know get to some um uh you know one in a one in a million chance This is the point that it's been repeated by, I think, some different Delaware jurists that the, the idea is not that to engage in casino like gambling with the residual value, that there's there's some point at which um, enough is enough. Um, uh, yeah, so it sounds I, like, so the, yeah. No, I was just going to I was going to add one point about that is if you think about the residual. So you know, I think what I often you know, think about the capital stack is sort of a, you know, a, a stack and then water rises up the stack and so and the water is the value of the of the company so you know if you're if you're envisioning a world where your value is above all the fixed claims well then there's water for the common to swim in um, as that water goes down and it enters for example the preferred's liquidation preference um the preferred's liquidation preference has now in some sense become part of the residual <laughs> and and their liquidation preference is not the same type of, uh, you know, get us everything you can type common um, uh, risk preference. They they do, in that sense, want some of their their money back. So at that point, when the when the proverbial water has fallen down, it's almost like you have a, a blended residual. And so it's logical that your your risk appetite would restrain a little. Uh, if you have any, you know, law professor folks who end up watching this, you know, I actually think this was the idea behind Credit Lyonnais, right? I think the Chancellor, when Chancellor Allen talked in Credit Lyonnais about boards being able to select uh, a more conservative path, particularly when they're in the vicinity of insolvency, I think he was thinking about this idea that you you now had people in that proverbial residual that had less of a of a risk orientation and you could take that into, into account. So I think it makes sense to dial it back a little bit as you get within the risk preference. That doesn't mean that you're not, you're not, you're, you're still gonna get business judgment protection absent some, some conflict, but that's how I harmonize it in my own mind with this idea that, you know, really you're supposed to be maximizing the residual. Excellent. Well, so, so let me, let me move a little bit beyond Trados and just offer uh, an opportunity to speak about other cases that you think might be relevant to a group of people um, sort of taking taking seriously the job of being on the board. I'll, I'll note again in this regard, it seems like um, you end up writing all these opinions whenever <laughs> they involve venture-backed boards. And so, uh, so I would love to know what you think is uh, kind of happening on the ground uh, in terms of uh, litigation risk in this area. Yeah, so I, I don't know if there's anything super new. Um, uh, what we what we tend to see is sort of old problems recurring because these are really problems of human nature, and uh, and so things are are cyclical. Um, in terms of in terms of cases and things that have been heavily litigated and things that I think sometimes people don't have the con the right conceptual understanding of, um, particularly directors who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, I think one that comes up a lot is redemption rights. Uh, I think that the holder of a redemption right will often come in and take the stance that it's effectively a debt claim and that the the company has to pay it and that they got to do whatever they can to to pay it. Um, but that's something and you know, I this is a, a case I, I wrote called ThoughtWorks um, and but it, it has come up uh, uh, multiple times since. The reality is that you, you as a preferred stock, you as a preferred investor have bought equity and equity is by definition permanent capital. And so even if you have a redemption right, you have a redemption right that is subject to the corporation being able to pay its other debts and subject to the corporation having enough money uh, to make some type of redemption uh, out, of its, out of its surplus. So you can't just 
come in as a redemption holder and bully the company and say, you know, shut it down or we're going to put you in bankruptcy. It's just not a thing. And so directors who, again, are thinking about maximizing value for the, the ultimate residual, including the common, they may have to take a, a hard stand against somebody who holds a redemption right and say to them, look, uh, you, you wish you had a debt claim. I know right now you'd like to have a debt claim, but there were some really good reasons why you brought, bought preferred stock, including the tax advantages you gave they, that you got uh, uh, with it. Um, you didn't have to take imputed interest and things like that, but there's a downside. And one of the downsides is you don't just get to show up like a debt holder and say, give me your money. So I think that's something that I, I would like um, you know, boards to, to think about more because it does come up and it, it came up as well. So the first time it came up was a setting where um, in ThoughtWorks, the, the, the holder of the redemption right and the management team were at odds. And so there was a, a natural resistance to the preferred stockholders redemption claim. Um, the second or third time it, it came up, probably third time, was this case called OD, ODN Holdings. And there, the holder of the redemption claim effectively controlled the board. They had been the lead investor. Um, they had you know, put the most money in. I, I don't remember whether they had hard majority board control or just effectively working uh, control, but they were the dominant force. And so what you what you had was the the company embarked on this on this harvesting strategy, where they basically just sold off a lot of assets, not because it was necessarily a good thing to do, but to create the cash that they could use to redeem this VC investor who wanted to be redeemed. Um, and there, because they had proceeded in that way, it opened a, a real question as to whether if they had done something differently, namely continue to manage those assets or um, you know, develop them, invested in them, things like that, they could have generated much more value than harvesting them and, and using them just to, to pump cash out to the, the VC investor. So that case went all the way to trial. Um, I ultimately held, again, in favor of the, of the defendants because I did think they were able to prove at trial um, that you know they they followed uh, they they made the right decisions effectively they they followed a fair process because it was an entire fairness case, um, but that was another situation where people seemed to look at this redemption right as if it was almost a debt claim to which these folks were entitled and that's that's just not the case so that that uh, that comes up uh, uh, recurrently uh, and a lot um, another one. <laughs> Another one that I, I wish uh, uh, outside directors would think about uh, is your 280G valuations. Um, what will often happen is your management team will tell you, we're going to value this company for uh, purposes of options uh, at a fair value of X, an insert number, and let's say it'll be $5 per share. And then within a year, maybe even shorter, maybe within two years, um, you will be in a, in, a, in, a tr in a situation where you're trying to transact at a price lower than that, sometimes substantially lower than that, like a dollar or two dollars per share. And you will invariably get beaten over the head in your deposition and, your, and, and at trial about the fact that you, you know, resolved for purposes of, a, of evaluation that you had to give to the IRS under penalty of law that your common was worth X, and now you're turning around, let's say six months later, and you're doing something uh, different. I think too often directors and the management team view those valuations as, as essentially something for employee morale. Um, and so they, they don't put a lot of thought into them. They get the cheapest provider to work up some type of valuation. And they don't think about the fact that this is gonna be a data point about the value of the company that's going to be hanging around. And so I would I would really like to see people treating that as a more substantive exercise than merely as an exercise in in uh, you know marketing to your employees. So those are those are two things that I could throw out there. Yeah, you know your your discussion of ODN and and of these valuation issues does sort of raise in my mind a, a, a reoccurring lesson or theme, which is that it's 
it's not a bad idea to have some of these fiduciary obligations like in mind along the way. In, in other words, like I think there's a, a tendency to try to concoct some process at the end to sort of tie a neat bow on things and make it look right. But, um, you know, like your decisions in ODN or Basho is another case, I think, where the, it's all this little stuff along the way, like, it, uh, you know, it, harvesting disinvestment, curtailing product development. And to the extent the record demonstrates that those things are motivated by uh, private equity liquidity needs or fundraising cycles for venture capital funds or things like that, those end up being bad facts at the end of the day that are a little hard to like scrub and clean up in litigation. Uh, absolutely. I mean, and, and the, the track record of behavior over time, I think is, is most telling. And so, you know, what, and what I, it really is true that folks who become outside directors at these companies are um, playing a, a, just a critical role. Uh, ideally, you know, I would never see what they've done or, or anything they're doing. Um, but I do think, you know, on the one hand, you're there, you're not the management team. So you don't know uh, as much about the, the company as the management team. Um, you're also not there on behalf of, you know, one of these uh, VC investors with their fund who is sort of there really with with money in the table on the, in, on the table. And so I do think there can be a little bit of uh, an urge or a, or a, um, uh, a practice of I'm just going to go along until they really need me to weigh in. Right. Or I'm not going to ask uh, questions because, you know, these folks know what they're talking about and if they need me for an independent committee or or an independent look at something, well, then I'll I'll deal with it. But I I really think that somebody has to be in the room there, you know, asking the proverbial dumb question, which you know, usually isn't a dumb question. Usually it's it's the it's the question that needs to be asked. Um, and you know, again, I'm probably going to ask it. I ask a lot of dumb questions. Um, so you you need somebody there who's going to say to management or even to the the venture capital uh, representatives, um, why are we doing this again? And you know, really walk me through it. Um, and one of the one of the things the, that I also find um, is that you know, the the folks in this business, particularly on the VC side, they feel like they see the same things over and over again. Um, you know, they, and so for example, the idea of a of a company that's grown too fast hasn't built up its internal controls needs to bring, bring in more, more professional management. They have some playbooks that they seem to default to in these settings. And I think it's good for outside directors to be thinking about, well, okay, that's what you normally do, but why are we necessarily doing that here? Is this the setting where we, where we need to do it? And so I think that, that ultimately the, one of the best things that the, the independent directors can do is is ask those types of devil's advocate questions, ask for for more detail, ask to have things really explained. Um, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to again in in the event the low likelihood event that you do have litigation, you don't want to be on the stand and having the lawyer who's cross examining you asking you why this makes sense and pointing out why it doesn't make sense, right? Like you want to have asked people that question and have had them explain to you in real time why it makes sense as opposed to to waiting to the, the courtroom. Excellent. Well, I, I can't uh, imagine a better sort of ending note for, for this conversation. So thank you so much for making the time to join us and for your attention to detail and your opinions. And um, thanks again. Well, it's been my pleasure and uh, I appreciate you organizing it. And again, I, I wish I could be out there with you in, per in person, but you know, this, this day job can be pesky. So thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>